Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke and I'm continuing the series Master Databricks and Open Source Apache Spark. This is lesson 26, PySpark, in which we talk about the new pandas UDFs, which means user defined functions. Let's jump in. What are we going to be doing here? We're going to be talking about Apache Arrow, which I call the performance equalizer, new pandas user defined functions, and new pandas function APIs, which is a little confusing, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's start by talking about the way code runs on a Spark cluster. We have any number of nodes, and the nodes are the way the work is split up. As we've learned before, we have the data is partitioned and sent out to the different nodes. And on the nodes, we can have one or more executors. And executors are where the real work happens. And as you can see in this uh, diagram here, we have an executor, and inside you see the, a JVM, which stands for Java Virtual Machine. Now, since Spark is written in Scala, and Scala is built upon Java, it's not surprising that it uses a JVM at the root of all the work. In fact, it ultimately converts all of the data, whatever it is, into resilient distributed data sets, RDDs, and processes those in the JVM. That can create a bit of a problem because if we want to do work, say, on a pandas data frame, maybe we want to do a transformation and we want to take the data frame and um, we're going to have to run code on it in the JVM. We're going to have to do the transformation in the JVM. What that means is to get the information out of the pandas data frame and into the JVM where it can have work done on it, it has to serialize, meaning it's going to have to export what's in the data frame into name value pairs, essentially text, that puts it into a sort of exported format, which is then imported into the JVM. So that's called serializing, where you write it out into essentially name value pairs, and then deserializing it when you ingest it into some other object. And that's going to have to happen for all of the data frame for the JVM to be able to process it. And as the work's done and the JVM wants to give the data back to pandas, it's going to have to cycle that back and serialize from the JVM this time and deserialize back into a pandas data frame. So obviously that's a lot of overhead. It can take a lot of time. And when you're trying to do custom Python code in parallel on a Spark cluster, especially a large data set on a big cluster, this can really slow things down. So let's take a look at what Apache Arrow does and how it makes this a whole different world. We see the executor as before, we see the JVM, but notice you don't see any serializing or deserializing. What you also can notice here is that you see the little arrow icon beneath the pandas data frame and the JVM. What that's actually signifying is that Arrow is a format which is being substituted in place of a pandas data frame. It's also being substituted in place of the JVM storage format, uh, which is for in memory, I should say. So now, instead of having to serialize and deserialize, they're using a common format. Since they're using a common format, it's like all in the family. It's all just going to go smoothly. We don't have to worry about this transferring back and forth. And that's a game changer because it means that Python code can now operate as fast as uh, Scala or other languages on Spark. It also has this broader implication. Arrow is not just designed to provide a common format for Python. It provides a common way to, tr to basically share information between Cassandra, HBase, R for that matter, if you want to do R data frames using Spark. And of course, you can see here Pandas. But when we talk about Spark, you can see that now the executors on Spark, as I've just demonstrated or shown, also use the Arrow format. So Arrow is a very interesting project. What it does is it changes format into an extremely efficient column store compressed format. So it's better than the default formats that would typically be used in all these different services, which will all be different. But it also, by giving a common format, it provides massive speed increase when you need to do work between these different services. So it's a win-win. A nice thing about this is that Arrow just transparently replaces these other formats behind the scenes and you don't really have to worry about it. So it's really a nice project, nice feature. The bottom line of all this is you can now run custom Python code in parallel over the cluster performantly. It's going to do just fine. 
let's talk about the new pandas user defined functions also called UDF right what these really are is something that's been around for a while but it hasn't had a very consistent syntax and that's caused confusion and it's it wasn't really well thought out when it first was developed in uh, sort of stages so as of spark 3.0 there's a newer and a more consistent format for how to write these functions and we can see here there's uh, four different types that we're talking about here now the big takeaway the biggest difference in the formatting is that a recent Python language edition is type hints as we know Python is a dynamic data typing language and that can make it problematic when you create functions and pass back values because you don't know what the data types are you never specify them type hints allow you to specify the type of input parameters and output parameters for functions now it will not enforce them in the sense that it won't break code if you don't follow it it won't give you syntax errors etc typically when you use type hints but it does make it a lot easier to understand what's happening in functions and it's really critical when you're doing things like distributed functions on spark so that's the big takeaway there's a few other differences when you get into this but looking for consistency and taking advantage of type hints is a key change so we'll talk about series to series iterator of series to iterator of series iterator of multiple series to iterator of series and series to scalar the big takeaway also is bear in mind these are vectorized functions vectorized operations perform much faster than if you just kind of just step through row after row in an array to process things it can work much faster and more efficiently so let's take a look at these types of UDFs a little more closely. I mentioned series to series. In a series to series, you pass in a series, but you can also pass in multiple series as an input parameter. So one or more input series, but you can only output a single series. So the idea is maybe you pass in um, a date or something and you pass in a date and you'd like to return the year from the date. So that could be an example of a function which would be series to series. The, at, the biggest rule about that is that the length of your input and output arrays must match. So your series you get 10 elements going in, you have to have 10 elements coming out. Then we have iterator of series to iterator of series. And it, the word iterator is a key thing there because what's happening now is where a series doesn't require you to do anything to step through the elements in iterator of series you're going to use a Python iterator to do that and that gives you some more control and because you have to set up and initialize the iterator you have some space in which you can initialize the state of the function so you could do something like get a broadcast variable to use etc it also provides some performance optimizations by being able to prefetch data but again the length of the output series and input series must match now unlike the series to series an iterator of series to iterator of series can only take in a single iterator of series or a single series now iterator of multiple series to iterator of series takes as it sounds multiple series one or more multiple series in in the form of a tuple and then returns a series back what you can do in a series to series which is one or more series are actually broken up into two different functions in using the iterator approach and as before we can initialize state and we get the benefits of prefetching data the input length of the series must be the same on input and output and finally we have a series to scalar series to scalar takes in a series a panda series as all of these are panda series we're talking about but it outputs a single value so this could be something like where you take a list of numbers in and then you just return a total or something like that a single number and I did borrow information from this link below I'll put a link in the description where you can get these slides so now we want to talk about new pandas function API's and again this is new in spark 3.0 and this is functionality that just did not exist before. We have map, grouped map, and co-group mapped. The first thing to notice in the new pandas function APIs is that they 
leverage data frames. So this is a nice, really nice feature because now we can actually pass in and get out data frames directly. So we can use pandas data frames and they work on Spark. The first one map takes and outputs an iterator of pandas data frame. And a nice feature is notice that it can return the output of arbitrary length. In other words, we don't have to have that number of elements going in equals number of elements going out. So we could do some sort of aggregation or whatever we need to and pass any length data frame back that we need. The grouped map also takes a data frame in, data frame out. But the idea behind this is using the old apply kind of thing that we're used to in both R and Python for that matter. And that's what this is about. So it's the split apply combine functionality. There's a pattern that's very popular and that is what we can do with group map. And cogroup map lets us do the same thing as group map, but we can join input data frames as part of that function. So it's a pretty short video. I wanted to really just kind of give you an overview of what we'll be talking about. And the first thing we discussed was Apache Arrow, the performance equalizer. And we saw that Arrow is very interesting because it just substitutes itself and its special optimized performance format in place of the normal formats that each different service would use. So it replaces what the JVM would use and it replaces the uh, Pandas data frame format transparently. You don't have to think about it or worry about it. And we also saw it works with other services as well. We looked at new Pandas user-defined functions and really what we learned is not so much that part was not totally new as much as it was an enhancement to the coding syntax. And so that's important though because it was just not quite as clean and consistent as it needed to be. And we're going to be taking advantage of type hints. Then we looked at new pandas function APIs. And the biggest distinguishing factor there is that they take in and return data frames, which is a really nice feature. A lot of power there. And all of these are designed to work with Apache Arrow and perform really well. And that's about it. Please leave comments, uh, questions. Please like, share, and subscribe. Really want to encourage people to subscribe so you get notified. Click on the notification button. You'll get notified of new videos as they come out. Let people you know know about my channel. I'd like to get as many people to benefit from this as possible. Until next time, I'm Paul and Fleur. We're all in this together. Thank you.